everyone. I'm Terry Gilman. I'm the owner of Creating Conversations, and I am delighted to welcome you to our event this afternoon with Jay Cohen. I personally am looking forward to being entertained and educated, and I think it's going to be a great afternoon for all of us. So without further ado, I am delighted to have Gwen Wexler, the immediate past president of CTJ, CTJ's sisterhood, uh, here to introduce Jake. Hi, everybody. My name is Gwen Wexler. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, on behalf of Sisterhood, I want to thank Terry Gilman of Creating Conversations for all her hard work uh, on this event. And we're so pleased to have Jake Cohen here with us today. Um, I'm going give, to give you a little bit of an introduction and a, a little bit about him. Um, Jake Cohen is the author of the New York Times bestselling cookbook, Jewish Reinvented Recipes from a Modern Mensch. Jake's debut cookbook, offers a delightfully delicious modern twist on Jewish food. His innovative recipes are influenced by his Ashkenazi heritage and his husband's Iraqi Persian traditions. I absolutely love everything that I've tried. Mm. You gotta try the uh, Iraqi roasted salmon. Yum, yum, yum. Um, Jake is a former staffer at Savour and the food ed a former food editor of Tasting Table in Time Out, New York. Um, most recently, he has served as editorial and test kitchen director of Feedback. Um, in, addition, in addition to being a food writer for publications, including Food 52, um, Food and Wine, and Real Simple, Jake enjoys sharing his videos and recipes on Instagram and TikTok. So um, I'm happy to introduce Jake Cohen. Hi, I am so excited for us all to be together, to cook and uh, chat. Uh, like I said, very informal, lots of chatting um lots of baking i feel like typically there's like a moderator and there's like the the cheesy questions but everyone's here together so you guys can ask literally whatever you want whether it's about the rogaloch we're making today and or i don't know anything you want to know or ask or chat about i really don't care this is your hour you own it go wild um but the recipe we're making today are my rogaloch we're gonna do the dough and then I'll talk you through I have a little bit of a surprise when it comes to the filling. Um, but the whole idea behind it was I, I love Rogaloch. I grew up with them. And it, it was something that I, I truly think is like one of the best like back pocket sweets because it doesn't require a ton of work um, to make a really great cookie. Uh, but at the same time, it's super customizable. I do some savory ones to really fuck with people because they really can't get through their head. Um, anything other than tradition, but we're going to kind of go through all of that. Let me grab the book. You all should have yours. There are a lot of fun recipes. I want everyone to let me know in the chat what they've been making. I know the Rocky salmon has been quite popular, which I am very happy about because I think it is quite delicious, easy, unique, definitely goes against what I think most people, especially with an Ashkenazi background, which I would assume a lot of you are, um, like myself, when I think of salmon, there's only like one form of salmon, um, other than lox in terms of cooked salmon, and that's uh, broiled. So the idea of kind of creating this super flavorful sauce, and that's kind of what almost like oil cooks it or oil poaches it because of the fact that it's coated and becomes barrier, super, super, super good. Um, love seeing food stains, love the um, eggplant tomato dip, which is a version of uh, Kashko Badam John that served this one restaurant here in New York that we love. But for the Rogalach, um, the funny thing is, is that I, I use this service called Gorillas in New York, which is great because it can deliver like groceries within 10 minutes. And this is the first time they've ever been late with my uh, cream cheese because I only had enough to make the, uh, the swap in the fridge. So there's a chance that we start with rolling out our rugelach and then we'll go back to making the dough if it doesn't come. So actually, that's exactly what I'll do. I made some in advance because I let my dough chill just for a little bit in the fridge. Little discs, I keep them in my freezer at all points. I just always think to have some on. You just let it defrost and then you can roll out some rugelach. But we're going to do this first and then we'll show you how to make the dough. And if you cannot, if you're only seeing my face right now, you have to swipe to make sure you're in, uh, is it the gal, the speaker view? Speaker view, um, because we have both 
myself and encounter cam highlighted because that has always been the number one thing that people complain about is that I can't see what's going on at the, with the food. So we're gonna make sure that that happens. We're gonna sprinkle a little flour. And then I have four types of rogelach in this book. And they're not like real recipes. It's just like flavor combinations. So I really love um, Nutella with halva because halva, which is the, this, this sesame candy made from literal just like tahini and sugar and then cooked and spun like cotton candy. It's really, really delicious, but it melts like super lacy in the oven because of the fact that there's not a ton of structure to it. I crumble that over some Nutella. You could also, I mean, use literally any chocolate spread you like, and it becomes these super delicious, nutty, chocolatey rugelach. Um, same deal with the other one, which is just PB and J, just because I think that like jelly has always been such a classic for rugelach to have uh, a little bit of peanut butter in there. That was great. And the savory ones are cacio e pepe. So obviously cheese and pepper and they're savory as well as everything bagel because obviously cream cheese dough, cream cheese filling, some wax. Um, it's actually really, really good. Okay, so I'm just rolling this out into a nine inch circle. Nothing crazy. It's a super easy dough to work with. And that was something that I really wanted it to be like very pliable, very Play-Doh-y. Um, today you're actually getting a sneak peek at my next book. Um, in which I'm working on a recipe for just one filling that I really, 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 really love. Um, inspired by a friend who owns a cookie shop, and that's Harosa um, Rogelach, which is really simple, really good. And this is kind of like that play on, on typically like you have walnuts or raisins in your Rogelach. Why not take it all the way? Add some apple, add some date, add some spices. So I'm going to roll this out, not crazy, you just want to leave about a half inch of a border and that's what's going to allow us to tuck everything in. Boom. Jake, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Um, so I am terrible at rolling dough. I never make anything that involves rolling dough because it's always terrible. Why? And I'm, I'm realizing that you're, you used a pretty small disc of dough. Do you just like, is that the secret for not? No, okay. um, <laughs> let me talk to you for a couple of reasons why you might have issues rolling dough. And my guess is there's a lot of cracking. It's, I think it's getting the, like an even consistency and then I can't peel it off the, the count. There's multiple things that happen, but it doesn't peel off the counter. It cracks. It's too thick in some places, too thin in others. It's just a disaster. <laughs> a few things. One is you need to make sure you're mixing your dough enough before you chill it. Okay. What the cracking is, or, or a difficulty working with a dough, is because the flour hasn't hydrated properly, um, and that's something that happens in the fridge. But if your dough isn't worked enough, it hasn't combined enough. Um, there's definitely overworking, which is the kind of other end. But I think people are so afraid of overworking their dough that most of the time they're underworking it. Okay, that's and great. For this, it's so easy. It's because it's like a it's it's these I make it so that it, the hydration is super good in which it's not sticky it's not tacky it really is that pliable play-doh which is the ideal thing to be working and then flowers your friend to make sure nothing sticks you I always if you saw one of the techniques I'll roll it out in the next one but roll I turn roll turn and that helps make sure everything is moving it keeps it even in terms of you were saying about like it could be lopsided sometimes that turning continues to to make sure even if your pressure is uneven, it becomes quite um, uh, even and just like a great circle in the end. So I'm just gonna roll these up and you can cut these depending on how big you want them. You could do uh, 12 or eight, which is what I did. Oop, so I throw it around. 
And here's your beautiful Ruggleoff, which I'm gonna put onto a parchment lined sheet pan. And then what I do is I typically take the, let me move this a little up, take the edges, pull them a little bit, fold over that little border that I left clean, and then we go up and you wanna make sure that the tip is at the bottom. And that's gonna be nice little glue for your dough. And you can do everything in advance. I think that that's the number one thing I love about, I don't know, pretty much anything is how much can I do in advance and still maintain integrity. Typically, I think the dough is the easiest thing. Um, I keep it in the freezer if it's gonna be any more than at like two days from baking just because it will oxidize. And that's just not fun uh, when your dough starts to oxidize, when it starts to turn a little grayish and it kind of starts to affect the flavor a little bit, definitely the, the color, it's just not ideal. So I'll like do things in the freezer and then you can freeze these at any point. So you can freeze them rolled up like this before they bake, or you can freeze them after you've like baked them to completion and then just like reheat them one by one or even eat them frozen, which I actually really love. Boom. Melissa, I have a hand, I see a hand raised. Let's chat. So, so I have a question. I grew up with um, my grandmother and I know this sounds disgusting, but I swear to God, it's good. She used Crisco. I always had sticks of Crisco in my house because that's how I make commissions. Yeah. My dough always works when I use Crisco and it never works when I use flour. You mean butter? How, what's your feeling about Crisco? I mean, Crisco is great. It's vegetable shortening. I think that there, there are really a million one ways you can kind of attack the fat aspect of it. There are some families that use just sour cream with that. Um, and then there's like a million one variations, depending if you're going to be making it par, which, which sounds like, um, I'm not, but you're not, but you, the origins I love the origin. <laughs> Sorry. We have these, we have these, um, these rituals and you do it because that's how it was always done. And that's a huge part of my favorite parts about Judaism and unpacking a lot of the stories and the recipes is like, what, how did we get here? And a lot of times it's rooted in Torah, which we just don't know about. Um, but something like that, so, so many families have memories of mothers or grandmothers cracking eggs into a separate bowls before you add it into the cake mix. Um, that wasn't because of shell, that was because of uh, if there was an, uh, what you call, blood spot, then it wouldn't be kosher. So there are all these little tidbits that get ingrained into our, our history. So if your family always used Crisco and that's what works with your recipe, amazing. Um, at the end of the day, I think you could play around and definitely find a fat that works. It will have to be adjusted because butter is, Crisco is pure fat, butter is not. Butter has water content, so it affects the recipe if you switch. So you need less you need less you need more crisco you it's not about less because it's still you're adding that water to the dough so you would have to potentially add more wow. butter um or just affect the flour ratio and then you just have to see how it works and how it incorporates okay so on that point so where did you learn i read this last night but i was tired so i don't really remember but how did you get to this point? How did you become the, how did you become this chef? So, a cookbook. Yeah. Um, I kind of always knew that food is where I wanted to end up. I went straight from high school to the Culinary Institute of America here in New York. And uh, from there, it was like, what are you going to do? You can either go work in restaurants, which I did. And then when I was realized that I, I didn't want to run a restaurant as my end goal, I, I switched to media and Jewish food came into play later on because that's even if it's a lot of people still fight it, but I think at the end of the day, so much of my connection to food, to hospitality, it's all rooted, rooted in Judaism. It's all rooted in my earliest memories, which are at Passover, at 
with my family eating Jewish foods. So that just became a very easy way. And then once I started it, you realize that actually not a lot of people are doing this and it's so important that we're preserving and celebrating Jewish culture in today's world that the book was a, was a no-brainer. So you see, this is what I'm talking about. We're moving it, where I'm giving it little shakes to pick up any flour. It rolls so easily, it really should stretch without any cracking. Beautiful. All right, who's got the next question? Hey, Jake, yeah, I have a question. Um, when I roll out dough, I understand that you get, if you use a lot of flour, eventually your dough just has a lot more flour in it than you wanted. And do you find that that affects the taste of these? Um, um, because I've tried different things like rolling out between silpats and stuff, but it can stick to the silpat. So I don't know. Yeah, so there are different things. The fact is, it's like we're not adding enough flour that it's affecting it in that way. I think some people are extra cautious and end up using too much flour just because. But um, there's really no need to, to go above and beyond because this dough itself is not super sticky. Um, and you really only need to use a small sprinkling and you can add more, but you can't take away. So that's just stuff to keep in mind. Yes, there are plenty of options in terms of rolling between parchment. I do find that's not like, A, it's, it's a little wasteful, and then B, it's, um, it's, it's just sometimes more difficult than you think. Jake, before we take Ellen's question out, Alexis asked in the chat, how big are the little packages that go into the freezer and what portion of the original dough recipe? So I make the full dough recipe and it's divided into four discs, which I promise we shall get to um, as soon as my cream cheese arrives. Um, but I think it's important to, to note is that you have, you have this dough, um, you want to make sure that it's even because you divide it into four, each one get rolled out and you'll end up with much bigger or much smaller depending on which disc you take if you don't do it evenly. So I actually really love to use a scale and just divide and um, go from there. All right, boom. And I love these pastry cutters. You also use a pizza wheel. It's just like a surefire way to get nice clean slices. Ellen, did you have a question? Um, I actually have two. Um, what's the surface that you're rolling on? Uh, my countertop. Yeah, no, I mean, what, what's your countertop made of that you're... I have no idea. I'm in a rental. It is something fake. Um, oh, not... okay, so it's it's not marble, because from here it looks like marble. Uh, that's it's very flattering to my building, but I can promise you it's not marble. Um, it's some kind of composite. Oh, okay, that explains the, your willingness to use the pizza cutter. Oh, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's another thing, very easily is roll it out on your counter and then slip in, especially I love these little, um, my mother-in-law always used them and I and I just ended up getting a bunch too. Um, these little plastic ones, they're great for A, meats, um, whenever you don't want like, I don't want to put, I don't know, chopping up a bunch of chicken on my nice cutting boards, I use one of these, but it's also great for doughs because it's super thin, you could just slide it right under and then cut. Okay, thank you. Of course. Renee. Okay, sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm the problem baker. Um, so this is just a general question. Um, after this Rosh Hashanah, I made honey cake again. It was probably the best honey cake I've ever made. And it's still just not that good. Would you agree that honey cake is just a bad idea? <laughs> Oh, unfortunately not. I actually just developed the honey cake for my next book and I love it. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so here's the deal. A lot of it comes down to playing around with fats, um, moisture content, like how much liquid is in it, and like coagulants that hold your cake together without adding too much flour. So 
Let me break that down. Butter. Cakes that use butter are always going to be drier than cakes that use oil because oil stays. It, the, it just the way that the flour hydrates with the oil creates that slick, moist feel to it. Um, not saying that that's the only thing that makes your cake moist, but it affects your mouthfeel, which kind of tricks you into thinking it's moister than it is. Um, then from there, what is kind of the binder? Sometimes it's with honey cakes, oftentimes it's coffee. Um, sometimes it's yogurt. I think I made my honey cake parv. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I made it. And again, I'm, I've been playing around with this stuff. I'm not parv, but I, I love the challenge of creating these environments of some cakes that are sour cream based or yogurt based or buttermilk bakes based in which you have dairy, um, which reacts with the eggs and co the proteins coagulate and helps create that, um, that cake feel in addition to adding acidity, which is important to re react with the leaveners. But it could be over baking and what you really need to be seeing at what point does it no longer jiggle toothpick comes out clean pulling that out and not over baking because you're over an overbaked cake will always be dry and then um past that you have uh the other point which is an underbaked cake is also gross to a degree sometimes it's nice a little bit but raw is raw we had a question about um making something non-dairy. I know we have the Crisco answer, but if you have any other ones, and then also making something gluten-free, do you use one-to-one -one gluten-free flour? Great question. Um, so non-dairy, there are a lot of fun things to play around with it. The easiest one is, let's say it's, so if it's butter, you can use margarine, you can use coconut oil, play around with that. If we're talking about like buttermilk or yogurt or sour cream, you could often just use a plant-based option, which they have now quite easily. You have a coconut-based yogurt and use that. Um, I also find that like, depends on the time of year. So in this time of year with apple cakes and honey cakes, applesauce translates really well for like a sour cream or a yogurt addition. Um, that being said, it's a lot more moisture. So you have to add in a little bit more flour too address that um, gluten-free wise one-to-one -one gluten-free things for free form rogelach babka chala very difficult um, my go-to is any type of cake or loaf if it's done in a pan you can use a one for one and it should come out great like perfect um, like even my, my apples and honey upside down cake from the book that one with a cup for cup will work totally fine. People do it all the time. Um, the, th the thing that people do that I hate, especially with dough, like, oh, can I just, can I make this rugelach dough? But um, I'm just gonna use almond flour. Uh, that's not gonna work. It'll never work. Almond flour just doesn't have structure, doesn't have gluten, which you really need. Um, but uh, the same thing goes for cake. So if you use just almond flour, you have to understand you have to use a lot more almond flour to make up for it and or a combination. Like I love a combo of almond flour and potato starch or almond flour and coconut flour. And these blends are super um, crucial to like having something that tastes close to gluten, fall, even though it's gluten free. How do I feel about high fat European butter versus regular butter? Depends. Uh, a lot of these butters, especially like a cultured butter or a grass fed um, milk butter is gonna have a lot more flavor and European butter has a higher fat content, which is also great. So really you have to play around for something like a um, pie dough. I really, really love European butter because it adds more flavor, it adds more fat, which is flakiness. So I think that's super crucial to uh, a really great pie dough or flaky dough for something like cookies or a cake. Yeah, it's nice, not crucial. I do think you need to do like you do need to like spend money on butter. I think that people skimp out on butter and I think that's a, a bad call. All right. So we're still going with this. What else? What next? We, we've got we got gluten free. We got that. Any other allergies that we can address? 
we are in California. Um, so it seems to me like a lot of your entry, as you said, was the Friday night Shabbat table. Do yeah. you have any recommendations on how many guests one should invite? And it looks like you incorporate prayers into your beginning. And how do you find people? Uh, do they like that? How does that go with your? Yeah. So um, the Shabbats, I think it depends on, on what you're most comfortable at. I do believe that everyone needs to find their comfort in entertaining and extending hospitality. And if that means you only start with six people or four people or two people, then so be it and grow from there. I typically do 10. Uh, I think 10 is a nice number for, um, for a table that's like big enough for two conversations. And then you could, it's also small enough that if you wanted to have one big one, um, it still works. But, um, I like that. I like that method. Um, we had Alexis ask, should the dough be really cold before rolling it out? Is that why you're taking it one disc at a time? Does it need to be super cold? Uh, not super, super cold. But again, if you are rolling them out, most likely your oven's preheated, which mine is. Um, your counter top might not be so cold. It's things like that. You have to start to think about your kitchen. My kitchen always gets pretty warm when I start baking. So in those moments, I do think it's extra important that I... Uh, keep it in the fridge just until I'm ready to go. And Jill says salted butter or unsalted? Always, I always use unsalted butter. A lot of people believe in using salted butter, which there's a place for that, but I just like to control it myself. Really, you could use them interchangeably. The only thing is if you use salted butter, you should taste and adjust because you might not need any salt. You might just need a little salt. Um, but like, let's say you're in a pinch, you could still make this with salted butter for sure. There is going to be a hamantashen recipe in my next book. Um, the thing, the reason I did and I, it, it was just, I don't know. I had everything else and it just felt out of place. And I just done this huge hamantashen feature for this magazine, Bake From Scratch. And it was like a, a big photo shoot of my master dough and five or six different fillings. And I just thought it was so comprehensive that I didn't really... I don't want to mess with it. I want to like, don't mess with a good thing. Um, but I'm going to be doing one for my next book. Um, TBD flavor. Got to keep some secrets, but I do think that hamantaschen are really yummy and delicious. And another thing that's super customizable, depending on what you like. I think that's the most important thing. People need to just like not be afraid to take control and be like, actually, this is not something I like, so here's how I'm going to pivot and not look for permission. You could always shove some I don't know, raspberry jam from the fridge and call it a day and people will still love it. Melissa, who's on our screen, makes about a thousand hamantaschen. Is that about right, Melissa? Every year. So she might end up liking your recipe better and we'll see. There you go. Sixteen hundred. Love it. Okay, so I have a full tray. Let me just clean up and I'm gonna show you what it takes to get these into the oven. Boom. And it's not like, it, because we go one thing at a time, doesn't take up a lot of space. It doesn't make a huge mess. Um, I think it's a great thing to get kids involved because of the dough is so easy. It's really easy to delegate this and not fear. I mean, there's, I, I'm never going to say it's foolproof because people have always proven me um, possible to mess up a recipe. But um, it's forgiving, which I think is important with the cookie especially. Um, Ellen asks, she says, I noticed you have weight measurements in addition to volume. Do you have a preference for your baking recipe? Uh, I like volume with the exception of a few ingredients. Flour, anything that you're using so much of, that's when we start to go. Anything like a tablespoon, a teaspoon, a, a quarter cup, third cup, I don't need a measurement for that because I'm not going to use a scale to measure two grams um, when you can just do it by volume. Um, the thing that does matter is when you're doing five cups of flour, seven cups of flour, that's when you really start to add up grams if you're compacting it or losing it if you're not actually doing a full scoop. 
So I do, do, do believe that um, it's always a great call to weigh out your flour. Sugar, too, if you'd like. I mean, sugar doesn't get really compacted like that, so I'm pretty fine using volume for everything but flour. So we have the rugula here. I always go in with a little egg wash. And this just helps get it nice and shiny. Doesn't have to be crazy. You just wanna make sure you get a nice little even covering on all of them. Yep, we lost your phone there. That was just a phone call from my mother, which is expected as always during things like this. Renee asked is how you make the egg wash. This is just one beaten egg, I do believe. Don't put anything in your egg wash. Not a pinch of salt, not some sugar, not not anything that affects it. No water, no cream, no none of that. One beaten egg. And I do think that in moments when when you're in a pinch, I never like to like cut corners. The only thing that I will say is I do find that just beaten egg white also works really well. I just do like the bit of golden hue that the yolk gives and helps get it even uh, browner in the oven. Wait, you wait. You do a whole egg. I would like that better. But I thought you were only supposed to use again mothers and grandmothers an egg yolk. Oh really? So an egg yolk, it'll be super glossy, um, but I don't think that's necessary. Um, <laughs> Just that some people do just the yolk some people do just the white because it's a bit cleaner and it kind of um because it's higher in protein it creates a little bit of a like a crystallized um look when it bakes interesting okay what about somebody told me that if you don't have an egg to do an egg wash i mean I, mine is for paula is what i was talking about but he told me you could use milk uh yeah you could use some cream that's not uncommon. That's like when you think of like British people and their scones, that's a, a very common thing for, for a biscuit. It's, it's just a, a cream wash. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not as good. It's not the same. Just go, go get the eggs. Always, if you're going to be making any type of cookie and you don't have extra eggs in your fridge, that should be the first thing you do when you decide to bake. Okay, sure. and I really want you to have a silicone pastry brush. Because all I can imagine is that pastry brush at my mother's house that is not clean. Just saying. Yeah, but I'll get to that. It is what it is. It all goes into the oven. It kills it. I like Ellen laughing at that. Anything bad will get killed off. Um, and now this isn't in the recipe, but it is something that's totally optional. There are a few things. You can put it in like this. You could sprinkle it with granulated sugar, or you could sprinkle it with turbinado sugar, which is sugar in the raw. Now I'm going to do just a little bit of that to finish. Again, not necessary, and you also can do this with literally just granulated sugar or other things that fit. I think for my, um, for the Nutella halva, I call for um, sesame seed garnish, for um, the, which we call PB&J, do a little flaky sea salt. This is the haroset flavor. I'm going to do some sugar, give it that almost apple pie kind of vibe. Beautiful. All right, this is going into a 375 oven for just like, I think 18 minutes. Or do I do, let me see what I do. Around with a few different times. Yes, 375. Um, I've tried with 350, and the thing is, is I like more color. I think that color is important with your dough, with your cookies. 400 even works if you're in a pinch. Um, but the thing about 400 is it gets pretty golden, especially on the top and bottom. But we want to make sure that the center cooks through. A few things about baking. Your oven, it is not even. So when you're baking something like this, it has to be as close to the center as possible. 
I do like, I typically, if I'm doing two trays at once, top third, bottom third, and then rotate them halfway through. If you just put something at the top, it's gonna get more gold on the top. If you put something at the bottom, you're like, oh, it burnt on the bottom before it got, got golden on the top. That's it. Another thing, sheet pans. I, you, you all look like you deserve some nice sheet pans. Uh, and I love Nordic wear or any of the metal ones. It has to be that thin. It can't, again, this isn't, I'm not saying this is like tin foil, but super thick trays will burn every pastry you bake on it. Always, because it conducts heat very well. Everyone I know who makes my challah recipe and asks me why is the bottom burnt, I ask them what kind of pan, and it's always one of those clunky, thick pans. They're not good for anything, really. Like, what, what, like, it's, it's, it, yes, if you're roasting things, but just makes it crazy. Air bake pans. Yes, those would work really well. The only thing is, we're brush I'm brushing with the egg wash. If you wanted to do that, you'd have to brush with the egg wash separately, sprinkle it separately, and then put it onto the air bake, uh, which are, are the pans that have like the, the holes in them, um, which are great for uh, a lot of um, sable crusts and plenty of other things that professional bakers do, but I, I, I don't think that it's ever that crucial. Um, just a normal pan, normal pan works. All right, this is gonna go in, and I need more questions because we are going to be chatting now. And let me actually let me see if uh, see if my groceries got left outside. They're not here yet, so we'll keep chatting. Arabic, not just the yolk. Use milk on pie crust. That great. Okay, who's next? Let's chat. Well, while we're waiting for the next question, Terry has decided that you should send those to us and then we'll taste them. You can send them by uh, airmail. Yeah, I mean, but listen, the, the, the book plates are and everything else, they just announced that all mail is getting slowed down. So mm -hmm. they won't be as good. That's the, another thing with cookies. You have to have them fresh. I'm a big believer in that. Day old cookies are not the same. People always want to like do things in advance and I get that, but there's so many steps that you can get to like make your life easier. Have them completely made and then freeze them and then defrost them. Um, or do like, um, whatchamacallit, have them frozen, have the dough frozen, have the assembled cookies frozen, so you just have to bake them. And they're freshly baked and you save yourself some time. What about the cookie pans that are always, there are two layers with the thing in between? I, I, I just think those are all like, not gimmicky, but like they're just not necessary. I think if you have a, a just a solid pan, you're going to be great. Um, if you use one and love it for a specific function, then then great. God bless. I'm just a big believer, and I I just can't. I don't have many one one function items because I live in a New York apartment. Um, <laughs> question about one table i'm on the board of an incredible nonprofit called one table um, it focuses on helping people in their 20s and 30s um, find a sustainable shabbat practice which i think is really really incredible since i didn't grow up with shabbat either and um, for a lot of the people using it it could be anything from they're similar to that or they grew up with shabbat and haven't had it since they left home um, or they've always kept Shabbat, but are looking to build Jewish community in whatever city they're living in. There are a million one reasons, but at the end of the day, Shabbat is it's an act of self-care. I think it's one of the most incredible Jewish rituals that is really focused in community and pausing and reflecting. And whether you say the prayers, don't say the prayers, that came up earlier, the beauty of Shabbat is still not lost. Um, I put in my book a little kind of primer on Shabbat and hosting Shabbat, and I do believe that I like we say the three prayers, but I do believe the most important thing is that you understand the meaning behind these prayers, the meaning behind these rituals, because for so many people, myself included, who go through Hebrew school, go through a traditional Jewish um, upbringing, they know they know all the prayers by heart, but they don't know why we say it. Like, why do we light candles? Why do we? bless a glass of wine. Why do we have chal on the table? And I think that's more important than saying a prayer in Hebrew. 
So I just wanted to make sure that all of that was on the table. So whether you just wanted to discuss the symbol of this ritual or say the prayer or do both or a different kind of version of that, amazing, as long as you're doing it because it's all good for you. Um, convection oven versus regular. I use a regular oven. Convection is great for getting a lot of color. It's not great because you have to relearn everything and every recipe does not work the same. So it becomes every recipe like, you get my book, you open it, you make the recipe, it's going to come out like it should. If you're using a convection oven, you have to lower the temperature, adjust the timing, and it still might not be the same. So then you have to like redo every temperature of everything that's baked, um, which is just like a hassle. So it's great if you're roasting a chicken. It's great if you're, 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 you're cooking up some potatoes. Yes, use it, use it, use it. For anything that you're comfortable with, it's going to add so much value for baking. Not necessarily. Um, timing, and uh, I think you said use parchment paper. Yes, I use parchment. Best alternative for cream cheese that's non-dairy and not almond-based. Oof. Uh, I would honestly just make it a full like margarine dough at that point and call it a day and then just add flavorings and not worry about that. Um, Timing and entertainment. What do I do ahead of the meal so I'm not stuck in the kitchen while people are visiting? That's my biggest pet peeve um, is I never want to be tied to the kitchen. And that is really, really, really easy with so much Jewish food because so much of the dishes that we make taste better the next day, two days and later. So any kind of a braise, I always say brisket is a three-day process. Your first day you make it, then you chill it. The second day you slice it, then it goes back into the sauce, chill it again. And then Friday, all you have to do is, is throw it on the stove on a low temp and let it reheat. Um, and that's always like, I say you're, you're splitting it up in between three days. As long as you got the room in your fridge, it's the easiest thing you could ever do. Um, that being said, uh, when we talk about like, everything else i love these sheet pans that we just talked about i have everything lined up so like let's say i'm roasting i have like a bunch of different roasted vegetables or two different dishes that i'm using multiple trays for once it's done because obviously you have to cook them on individual trays make sure it's spread out it's nice and it's nice and golden and tender once that's done i'll do that about like an hour or two in advance of actual dinner and then i just kind of combine them all in one pan or I'll push them all and I'll split a pan and this will all be like roasted broccoli and these will all be the potatoes and then I just can throw it into flash in the oven while everything is reheating and I try to have a good balance. So I have two full sheet pans in the oven and something on the stove and then a space so that the pans can land and you just have to think that way. And once you have that down, it's quite simple because you can interchange it with a million different dishes talking about the braise. The braise could have been a pasta that you keep on the stove. It could be your soup and then you need two. One for your soup, one for your matzo balls or um, I don't know, a million one other things so that everything is pretty much done and anything that's not done like won't take long. So I'm thinking like salad. Like I'm not going to dress my salad in advance but I have a giant bowl with everything in undressed or as many things that can be and then I'll just like chop an avocado, throw on the dressing, toss it up, done. Um, and then dessert is always done with the exception of like a warm cake that I will sometimes do, like throw it in right as people arrive um, or right, like, or not, um, sorry, uh, like right as everything comes out to go to the table, then you throw it in if it's not going to cook long. Same thing with cookies. I'll do cookies all in minute because there's something really nice about a warm, freshly baked tray of cookies, and you can have everything, the dough, all of that done, and then you just get it ready to bake. All right, I'm gonna take this off just for a second because I'm figuring out what happened. If my thing just never arrived, and if so, then we can just keep chatting. It says it was delivered, so let me figure that out. Unless I sent it to the wrong apartment, which is very valid. Let me check my door again, and if not. I think Renee's question is really good about how to like structure your menu and your timing. If anyone else has any advice while Jake is looking at his door. 
Oh, I come here. I can talk about my mom's latkes and variations. Okay, so my mom makes the best latkes. She's not like a, like a crazy, crazy, crazy great cook, um, but she has her dishes. I feel like every like there there people have like mothers who are terrible cooks. People have mothers who are great cooks, and she's like fine. But she makes a few things really, really well, and her latkes are incredible. Um, and I took over and she never had a recipe. She would just like have everything and then she would just feel it until it was the right consistency and start frying it. My sister and I um, would sit waiting to um, pick everything up, like pick them up right out of the oil and shove it into cold applesauce so we didn't burn our fingers. And now it's like one of my favorite traditions to take on. That being said, we mentioned before, it's like with the book, a lot of it is the influence of my upbringing and my husband's and it's not uncommon in his family for a lot of the women to have married Ashkenazi men. And that has led to so many different tips and techniques and ideas for blending foods and flavors. And his aunt, um... all right, they got delivered to the wrong apartment. I knew it was, I knew there was something. Um... And what she, his aunt told me is that you have to start adding saffron to your latkes and it makes it taste just like potato toddy. And it's so great um, because it's just like one little thing that takes latkes into a completely different direction. Um, and then obviously I do a variation with like, with some root vegetables. You're using potatoes with sweet potatoes and um, parsnip and carrot. You could use anything you want. And yes, you can like, when I'm making, if I'm making just like, one batch of latkes, it's a pound of potatoes, which is like two to three russet potatoes. I, I can use a box grater for that. I don't need to wash my entire my entire um, food processor with grating attachment for two potatoes. That being said, you can totally do that. Um, you could also like, whenever I'm making lots and lots of latkes, like I did a, I had Shabbat for like 40 people and I'm making 100 latkes, like yeah, I use the, the grating attachment. I think that's super easy. Um, but yeah, I think it's also important to really, really, really pay attention to a lot of things with latkes. Um, squeezing out the liquid is like the number one thing. Um, uh, people who don't do that, it's crazy. Some people don't also use like, they cook their potatoes first, so it's like mashed potatoes, uh, which I find fascinating, but to each their own. I love that. I think authenticity for a recipe only goes as far as one family. So if that's what's authentic to your family is what a latke is then I'm not gonna argue with that. Um, that being said, that's the, the thing that's really interesting is how people align with others that have that kind of same, um, same uh, idea, which is like when people have like hey. preference to one, one particular like person, like Joe Nathan's matzo ball soup or this, that, um, you just start to see who thinks similarly to your family. Hillary. So, yes. So my question was about squeezing the liquid out of the potatoes. Um, do you use cheesecloth? To, like how, what's the best way to do that? And then also how do I fry stuff without like A, getting terrified that I'm going to gain a hundred pounds and B, like getting my kitchen like covered in grease immediately. And then everything is really gross. Like I'm kind of scared of frying stuff. So a um, huge part is the oxidation. You have to squeeze out your you great and then squeeze out immediately. Thank you. Um, squeeze out all the liquid immediately. If you keep your potatoes still wet, then they are going to oxidize a lot, oxidize a lot faster. Um, the other thing is, is that you have to work fast. You have to have everything ready. I have everything ready so that I grate the potatoes, I mix it, I fry it. My pan already has oil and it's on like a very low flame when I'm grating the potatoes because I don't want to wait. Um, so even if I'm making 100, 200 latkes, it will be fine as long as you get going fast um, and squeeze out every drop of liquid. Then in terms of the frying, I mean, I think everything in, in balance, I don't think you actually ever have to worry about it. You're never gonna gain so much weight People don't understand like how much you have to eat to gain to gain one pound of fat. Like you have to eat like an extra, I don't know, well over three thousand calories above your daily allotted portion. Um, 
but like if you do that one day it's it's totally fine if you do it every day then that's another story and then on that i'm gonna be like okay latkes are not an everyday food are they a few times a year food 100 percent. treat yourself okay we're going back i'll quickly show you this and then we could wrap up because this will only take my back yes uh, cause this will only take a few seconds and then it can go through. We have a cast iron grill that we only use for latkes and keep it on the outside, uh, keeps the oil spill outside. That's a great idea too. Um, I think another thing in terms of the smell, it happens. As long as you're not going crazy and you're, like, if you squeeze out a little liquid, it's not going to splatter as much, which is super important. Um, in terms of the smell, yeah, it smells a little, it's fine. And then past that. Uh, you can also get splatter shields, which I really love. Sour cream to keep from browning. That's true. Acidity helps. I also find that um, just like having it assembled with the eggs with the potato starch that I always take always helps as well. Um, here for the dough, I got a stick of butter and a stick of cream cheese. Eight ounces of cream cheese, four ounces of butter. I'm going to throw in quarter cup of powdered sugar. I use powdered instead of granulated because granulated actually will um, will not incorporate as well and they'll end up creating tears. And I don't want that for a very pliable dough. So that's why think of like the consistency of a sugar cookie dough and how it kind of tears apart because of the sugar crystals. I don't want that, which is why we're gonna be using this. I'm just going to clean this together. I'm going to throw in half a teaspoon of salt. Salt in everything. Never, well, again, these, these are in none of the recipes that I got from, as I learned how to make Jewish food, none of them has salt. But you need it. And then scraping often. To make sure that everything gets picked up. That's why you gotta use room temperature things. I hate when people are like, oh, it's, it's the dough's not looking well. It's because, well, I didn't wanna wait for it to get to room temperature, so I threw it in the microwave, and then it was liquid, and then this and that. Um, these all affect the recipe, so that's why it's so important that when you're doing this, just take it out. Hillary, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Um, sorry, I. my question was, have you ever used one of those uh, mixers blades with the rubber scraper on the edge and do you like those yeah I had one for I had one um, I don't think that I think that you still will need to you'll still need to you'll still need to go down and scrape it because a lot of times the issue is that it, it hikes up higher on the um, higher on the bowl so you're gonna have to scrape it either way so if you're gonna scrape it once why not scrape the whole thing I think too often these things come up and they're like, oh, this is my, this is going to be a, a lifesaver. And will it help? A hundred percent, but it's not going to be like a replacement for scraping. All right. This is nice and incorporated and fluffy and creamy. It should honestly start to look like cream cheese frosting. And then all we're doing, because really that's what Rugula dough is. It's, it's cream cheese frosting that we are setting with flour. Um, I'm putting in three and a third cups of all-purpose flour. I measured this by weight, which is 315 grams. Cookies are in the oven. They'll be out in Honestly, the perfect time. I'm just gonna come out right as we, we wrap up. But this comes together. We don't wanna overwork it, but I want it to come into a really like clean, smooth ball. So this is gonna be a perfect part to talk about what we were saying earlier about like underworking your dough. So I am not gonna stop until it really all clumps together. It's the same thing if you do it in, in like a food processor. You want it homogenous. It's 
clean the sides of the bowl, which is what we were looking for. I'm going to throw this back in, take off my paddle. And then I always go in and give it a few squeezes and use it like putty to pick up any bits to make sure. It really, you see, it's like Play-Doh. That is a, like, that's the consistency you always want. And then from there, I just will break it off into four pieces, wrap each one in plastic wrap, and keep it in the fridge or freezer, depending on when you're going to bake them. Wash my hands and I'll grab out our cookies so we can see the finished product. And here we go, over here. Boom. Those are our baked rugelach. So, key thing you want to look for. One, top is golden. Two, bottom is golden. You want to make sure that it's nice and even, but not too dark. The bottoms, the bottoms will burn before the tops will, just because this is a tender dough. This is not something with a crazy high, um, like sugar content, so it's not going to get as as um, golden. Even that's why we egg wash it. Hillary, again, send us send us off with the last question. Oh no. <laughs> I think Hillary might have done that by accident because I keep asking her to unmute. Hillary, are you there? We lost her. We lost her. Oh, well. All right. Let's see. Any other work. last questions? <laughs> you going to send this to us? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I was going to say, Jake, I think what we should have done is had you freeze some for us and send them to us overnight, and we could have had a tasting here in Manhattan Beach. There you go, from Manhattan <laughs> to Manhattan Beach. Love it. Hey, speaking on behalf of Creating Conversations and TGJ Sisterhood, we cannot thank you enough for such a lovely treat this afternoon. As a non-cook, I think I'm going to go break out the book and try my hand at it <laughs> you make it look easy um and your book is amazing and we're just very grateful to you for your time and i think it's a wrap jake thank you so very very much so much fun chatting with all of you um i will see you all soon Bye. we can't wait for the next one <laughs>